Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC 231. So uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how you can make your own functions. So I know in lab six that I got a lot of questions and comments regarding the amount of repeated code in your labs. Basically you had to for say ver different uh, values of N or T or something like that, do basically the same calculation with your if statements and loops and all that kind of stuff, but with one variable a little bit different. And there wasn't really a good way of consolidating that while also letting, you know, some of those outputs equal, you know, variables like PO, say PO1A, PO1B, PO1C, stuff like that. There wasn't really a good way of doing that other than just writing out the code a whole bunch. So it's stuff like that that makes this lesson really useful. So um, remember, I, I want to start off by reminding you that a function, basically it's a thing that takes in certain inputs and gives back certain outputs. So it takes in at least one input. Like for example, I have this loan function here. Loan takes in three inputs, amount, rate, and the number of years. And it gives us two outputs this amount M and amount T. Now I'll go into what loan does in just a second, but I want to remind you all that that's what a function does, is it just takes in a certain amount of inputs and gives back a certain amount of outputs, and how it transforms those inputs into outputs is basically defined by the function itself. So what I'm going to do in this lesson is I'm going to talk about how you can make your own function, and basically your life as a programmer becomes a lot easier from here from here on out. At least hopefully it does. All right, so let's take a look at this loan function and see what it's about. So the first thing I wanna do is I'm going to open up this loan.m file here and you'll see what looks a bit like a script file, except there's a few key differences. So let's come back over here. Notice how this right here it's just a regular script file, right? We have all this code, and at the end we print out an amount, um, and we just kind of leave it at that. However, this loan.m file right here, the first line right here is this thing that says function. And we'll talk about what this is in just a sec, but the fact that it starts with this line starting with function is um, it, this designates it to MATLAB as a function file rather than a script file. So this right here is a script file. This is a function file because it has this line right here. This line is what we call the function definition line, where it basically tells MATLAB what inputs it's taking in and what outputs it's giving back. So right here, the first part of the function definition line is this keyword function, which says, hey, MATLAB, I'm about to define a function. Just keep that in mind as you parse the rest of this file. Then what you'll see here is this uh, basically what looks like a array of two variables, amount m and amount t. What this is, is this is an array of output variables. And we don't have amount m and amount t defined yet, but that's totally fine because we are telling MATLAB, hey, these are the two output variables that we're going to get from this function. I want you to save the, the uh, information that you, basically the information that I want you to return, the first bit of information will be saved in amount m, as you can see down on line 15 here, that's where, uh, that's one piece of the output. The second piece of the output, the second piece of information I want you to return, will be saved in a variable called amount t. And what happens is when MATLAB ends up running this function, eventually it will come down to amount m. It'll say, okay, I'm going to uh, save all this information in amount m. It saves all this information in amount t, and then it says, okay, now I will give back amount m and amount t to whoever called this function. Uh, a little bit more on that later. Now over here, we have this equals and then all this stuff over here. Basically, this part, <clears throat> excuse me, this part right here, this gives us the name of the function and the arguments it takes in. So we can see that the name of the function is loan and it takes in three arguments, one called amount, 
one called rate and one called time. And this equal sign here basically says that the output of loan amount, rate, and time will be saved to this uh, structure here. So that all is the information encoded in the function definition, which is a lot probably to keep track of, but you do want to know how this works. This is really important for when you're building your own function. All right, now the next thing I want you to notice is all of these comments right here. Now I'm going to say right away, this is mandatory for you to do for every single function. What we have here is what the textbook refers to as H1, but this is basically, this first line of, co of a comment is basically a brief description of, uh, of the function right here. So loan calculates the monthly and total amount of payment for a loan with an amount, rate, and time. So it gives a very brief discussion of what this function does. Um, then right here, I have a list of inputs, which, which actually says what um, amount, rate, and time actually do. So the amount is the loan amount in dollars, rate is the annual interest rate, and time is the amount of time to pay back in years. And outputs, it gives what amount M and amount T are. Amount M is the amount to be paid each month in dollars. Amount T is the amount to be paid in total in dollars. The reason why this is mandatory is because, let's say I'm in here and I'm not sure what loan does. Well, I can just type in help loan. And right here, you can see basically all of the comments that I made are given right there. So it's really important for you to for you to um, actually put this comment under here because we want to be able to actually ask MATLAB to tell us, hey, this is uh, this is what my file does. So I do want you to put this uh, put a com put a uh, block of comments like this in every single function you make from here on out and every single function file. Um, definitely. Comments are super helpful anyway. You should definitely put in as many as you are necessary, and that, sorry, as many as you think are necessary. And then once you have that many, probably double the amount of comments anyway. Um, but you you should have comments explaining all of your code and what it is doing. So we have the function definition. We have this block of comments telling us what the function does. And now all the uh, all of the rest of the lines here are what is known as the function body. So what happens here is when your function is called, MATLAB will take amount, rate, and time, basically put those in our workspace here as values, um, as variables with a specific value. And then it will run all of this code, accessing amount, rate, and time as it goes. You can see rate is used right here. Uh, amount is used there, and time is used uh, in all of these places here. And basically, it run it makes all these computations using all of these values because MATLAB will take the values that we pass in here and store them into memory. So when we actually make the call in loan right here, we're going to put amount, whatever uh, value we get for amount, we'll put that in here. We'll put whatever rate we get in here. Actually. Why don't I just run an example? So if you want to use a function, what you want to do is you want to specifically make sure that you're running the script that actually uses the function. If you try to run the function loan by itself, here's what happens. You can see that loan, is, uh, loan has this error of not enough input arguments. The reason why is because MATLAB will see, will, uh, when you press this run command, MATLAB just takes the name of the script and puts it in by itself. And then it'll say, okay, well, the function named loan actually needs inputs and we're not giving it, given any inputs, so there's a problem right here. What you could do is do something like in the command window, type in loan of, uh, let's say you borrow $450 at, as, at 5% for five years. You can do something like this. 
the answer is uh well let's see we would want to do um amount m amount t equals that and okay here we go amount m gives you 8.46 amount t gives you 507.41 now i want you to notice see how we have a and b defined in lines 14 and 15 notice how a and b don't actually show up right here and honestly neither do amount rate or time and the reason why is that all of those variables amount rate time a b uh, rate underscore m all of the variables defined in the function block and define in what we call the parameters of the function all of these variables are considered local to the function completely so as soon as what MATLAB will do is it will go into the function, it will define all of these variables, it will take these values here and return them to back to the user, and then what it does is it exits the function, and all of a sudden a, b, rate underscore m, amount, rate, and time they all go away and disappear. So the only stuff we're left with in the workspace are amount m and amount t, which we defined right here and our answer. All right, so now that we've shown sort of how a function works by itself and when you call it in a command window, what I want to do is I want to show how a function works when you actually call it in a script file by itself. So I have this little script that basically takes in user input for the loan amount, rate, and number of years, and then calculates the loan amount using the loan function on line four, and then prints out the result. So let's take a look at this. When I run it, uh, this all works as normal, uh, as you might expect if you are familiar with the input command. So loan amount, let's do the same numbers here, 450, uh, loan rate is 0 0.05, and I think number of years was 5, but I could be wrong. Yes, that was right. So what I have here is I have formatted the output as you will pay, uh, uh, let me actually, what I should do is put dollar signs right here. So let's try that again. Let's say 450, 0 0.05, and 5. Look at that. It actually looks like money now. So, uh, well, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you'll pay 846 each month for a total of 547.41. Uh, so that is an example of how you would use your loan function. Basically, you would use the loan function in pretty much the exact same way that you would use any other function. So now what you can do is if you have repeated values or sorry, repeated code that you're trying to do, let's say if I gave you something like try to calculate the loan for these three amounts of time with a 5% rate in five years. Uh, basically what you can do is you can actually make your own function, like what I did over here, you can make your own loan function and then uh, actually be able to just say, uh, let's actually do something clever, hopefully. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say amount equals, let's say um, we're going to start at 500. We're going to increase by 100 until we hit 1000. So we're going to look at the different prices for borrowing 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, and 1,000. Um, I'm going to set the rate at 0 0.05, and I'm going to set the number of years at 5. Now, what we're going to do here is I'm actually going to write a for loop over the everything in the amount. So for, actually, I should move this here. Uh, so... For amount equals all of that, uh, we'll indent this, indent this, type in, type in end like so. And what I'm going to do here is saying, if you borrow uh, percent, so dollar sign percent point two, oh, my trackpad hates me, percent point two F, you will pay all that amount. So let's do something like this and see what happens. So I'm going to uh, clear CLC, 
and run this. Oh, I forgot to semicolon there, so let me uh, clear CLC again and run. And here we go. If you borrow five hundred dollars, then uh, then you uh, will pay. I, I won't bother fixing them the uh, in the output, but imagine that I did fix that. I guess so. Basically, if uh, what I've done right here is I have run the loan command for every single amount between 500 and 1,000. Now, the nice thing about this is, is that <clears throat> if this were with, uh, if we weren't using a function here, you might have to uh, type out the loan, uh, sorry, you might have to type out the loan value, or the loan calculation for each of those amounts. Uh, another way that the loan function might be helpful here is if you do something like this. So let's say I give you specific amounts. So I don't know why I deleted all that. Let's say um, let's say I am trying to ask you to give me let's say P O one A or let's see let's say the amount for say problem one A is four hundred seventy. Wow, four hundred seventy. Uh, Let's see, P01A equals all of that output. Let's see. Let me see how that turns out really quick before I proceed. So I will CLC clear, actually CLC this time. Um, let's see what P01A ends up being. Okay, so actually what I have to do is amount M, amount T and then PO1A equals uh, amount M amount T. So something like this, right? Let's say that this is what we're trying what I want you to do for a specific question. And then for PO1B, I want you to do, let's say now amount equals uh, 513. You can basically just copy all of this like so and paste it down here. Just replace this with uh, PO1B. And what ends up happening is that you don't have to rewrite all of this code for PO1A and PO1B. You can just call this loan function again. So it actually saves the, uh, another, I guess another good use for functions is it prevents you from having to rewrite a whole bunch of code over and over and over again. So now if we look, we can see PO1A and PO1B both are updated for each of their respective amounts. All right, so let's take a look at another function. What I have is this function called object fall, which takes in Y initial, V initial, and time, and gives out a Y final and V final. Basically, what I'm, what I'm uh, trying to calculate is if I have an object uh, with an initial height of y initial and an initial velocity of v initial, um, I'm trying to calculate after a certain amount of time in seconds, uh, let me actually put that here, in seconds, after a certain amount of time in seconds, what the object's, uh, what the object's words, what its uh, y position will be and uh, velocity will be after that certain amount of time has passed. So I have the um, I have this comment block here describing what it does. I uh, I'd recommend pausing it if you want to check it out. But basically, I have all these calculations here, which should be reminiscent of physics. The one thing that I added, however, is that if y final would be would be less than zero based on these calculations, I'm just saying that okay, well that means that it just hit the ground. So. Um, I just set y final to be equal to zero and v final to be equal to zero as well because you know the object has just hit the ground and I'm assuming that there's no bounce, uh, so assume no bounce right here. Uh, the one thing I do want to specify is that if y final happens to exactly equal zero, then I'll still put that the, that it has a velocity just because we'll consider that the velocity at the moment of impact. I don't know why I have a colon right there. So. Let's try running this and see what happens. 
And you can see that there's an unrecognized function or variable object fall, which seems problematic, and it is. Um, but the reason why is actually because you can see up here, I didn't save the file with object fall in it. So I'm actually going to save that right now. Let's see, object fall.m. All right, it's saved now. Let's see how that goes. So I'll try running it again. Oh boy. All right. Line one, column 29. You get to actually see me debug in person, which is super cool, I'm sure. I forgot an equal sign. No wonder. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, y initial equals. I should add Y initial here as well. That's my bad. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's take a look at how this works now. So what I'm asking right here is basically... With the, if we have an initial velocity of three and a final velocity, uh, sorry, have an initial velocity of three meters per second uh, facing upwards and an initial height of 15 meters above the ground. Basically, I'm trying to calculate the object's height as, uh, as one second after two seconds after three seconds after. Actually, let's start it at zero. So at zero seconds, at one second, two seconds, three seconds, and so on. Um, it seems like there is a issue here. I'll just do this. Okay. <sighs> My apologies. I am coding way too late at night. I forgot to do an end. Uh, I think the most important thing that we can take out of this is even ex uh, people with plenty of coding experience in under their belts. I mean, I've been coding for over five years now, uh, I still make mistakes. Hopefully that's a valuable lesson that you are never safe from making mistakes, but also it's not a bad thing if you make mistakes. Anyway, let's take a look. Uh, and what we can figure out is that I forgot to put a new line at the end of this. Uh, that should be 0.3f slash n. Let's try that one more time. Perfect. Uh, so let's take a look at how that goes. Uh, Let's see. Why? What? Okay, there we go. It seems to have fixed itself. So you can see uh, that every second, at, at every second, we're look, taking a look at the height, the velocity, all of that fun stuff. And what we can actually do is we can, uh, let's say, it seems to hit the ground somewhere between three and four seconds. So let's say, 0.54. See what happens over those four seconds. So zero seconds, height is that, 0.5 seconds. You can see that the height goes up for a little bit and then it comes back down as the velocity continues to decrease due to acceleration by gravity. So that's just another fun way of using functions like this is that we can use it to simplify all this code right here. It would honestly be painful to try to understand what's going on in this script if we had to put all of this code inside of the loop. So it just makes it makes things a little bit, actually quite a bit easier for us if we're trying to understand, you know, what's going on in this code. Um, especially, say, in the future, if you are programming with MATLAB, and I'd say that's a pretty likely given the state of the industry right now you will probably be working collaboratively with people and you will have these giant databases of code with lots of functions going on and then some script files that use all of those giant databases of functions. So the nice thing about this is using functions like this makes it easier to understand what's going on. So you have this main script and you say, okay, well, this main script relies on this object fall function, which I can imagine I would imagine calculates uh, the height and velocity after the object has fallen, but we can take a look at help object fall and see what happens here. Oh wow, look at this fantastic and very convenient description of what this does right here. <clears throat> so that is basically uh, 
a good, I'd say a very compelling reason why functions are very important is it makes things a lot easier to read, especially when you're working in teams. I'd say the, uh, another big compelling reason is that it, um, it basically saves the amount of code that you have to type if you have to repeatedly calculate, like make a calculation. Uh, or if you want to think about it this way, it saves the amount of code you have to copy and paste from older code. The other nice thing is that, say I find a mistake in my object fall code, I can fix it here, and then it's fixed everywhere that I call object fall. So that's another really great way uh, place is that it makes it super convenient to fix errors uh, that otherwise might show up in a lot of different individual places where you'd have to fix them all manually yourself. All right, well, that is, uh, that is the video for the first part of chapter seven. The second part of chapter seven, we will talk about for uh, the class after this, but right now we're just gonna end it here. If you want more examples, um, uh, if you want more examples of user of user defined functions, if you take a look at your textbook on page 229, it's uh, section 7.6 examples of simple user defined functions. That is probably a good place to start. Don't worry about anything 7.7 .7 onward. We will talk about all that stuff uh, in the next video because it gets just a little bit crazier than this. But yeah, that's the end of this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day.